Good evening, everyone. Tonight we have a very nice treat. We have Dr. Blakeman here. He is a orthopedic surgeon. That's correct. And he has retired. been retired. He spent some time in the military working in a pulmonary center or two. So he understands how dust and everything affects your lungs. And that's actually what he's going to talk about tonight in the toxicity and the problems that dust and turning can have with us and how to protect ourselves. I'm going to turn it over to the good doctor and let him do his thing. All right. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, John uh, for inviting me. Kylie, uh, they're stuck with staying with me until we get finished. I, Kylie's just here from California. She's here for one day. So it, uh, it had to be quick. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about some things that you already know, or at least you think you know. And I say that because I thought I knew, uh, and it's like so many things. There's uh, George Freeman, who is sort of responsible for getting me here tonight. I'm going to quote him, and he says, as long as you're getting away with doing something, you think it's okay. Uh, and, and many of us say, well, I've, I've always done it this way. And so that's the way, that's the way I do it. Uh, my own father smoked, but guess what? He died of cancer. Uh, it was the way he, he did it, and, and he wasn't going to change. For the most part, um, everything goes okay. And... Uh, when we're working in the shop, we expect things to go okay. Unfortunately, I got to see things when they didn't go okay. And I got to see these things over and over and over again. Sometimes it'd be on Christmas Eve when someone was trying to hurry and get a project done for Christmas Day. Sometimes it was in the early morning when Someone wanted to get some project done to go take to a show or whatever they were getting done. But um, when we're doing woodworking, we use a lot of instruments. When we're turning, we use a lot of instruments, different powered instruments. And uh, if I could have a, uh, yeah, next slide. So what I'm going to talk about is a little bit of wood turning safety. You can go ahead. <laughs> First question is, what is the most dangerous power tool you can buy? That's exactly right. <laughs> the chainsaw. There's about all right, 36 to 40,000 ER visits per year with chainsaw injuries. Now, we don't think about that unless you're on the end that's taken care of. And... Um, Next slide. The national, uh, no, go back one, please. No, 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 no. Okay, that's one, one more, a couple back. One more back. Okay, the National Injury Surveillance System between 2009 and 2013 showed 115,000 chainsaw injuries. 95% are males, usually young males, 30 to 59. The medical costs are about $350 million a year taking care of chainsaw injuries. Average is about $12,000 each injury. Uh, it's a significant number that we don't ever think about until we have to shell out some of the money. Next slide. Showing you where most of the chainsaw injuries occur. Uh, obviously to the left hand side. Most of us hold the chainsaw with the right hand and the injuries occur on the left hand side. Uh, most of the upper extremities and the, and the left leg but uh, not, not excluded to that. Um, the, uh, the problem with, with the chainsaw is bounce back. And we catch the saw with our hand. Unfortunately, we let it drop to our leg. Unfortunately, we don't catch it at all. Uh, the uh, problems with, uh, I had a, it's, it's not just the newbies, it's not just the guys that 
haven't used a saw before. But by the same token, the professionals rarely get hurt. It's the guys that uh, are the occasional users. Had a good friend who uh, was a shop teacher at Aurora High School in, in Denver, out of Denver, Colorado. And he moved to Santa Fe after he retired. His life's ambition was to start a children's golf clinic where they could teach children to play golf. Ruin their day too. But he, uh, he, he, was, he was very good and he was a very good golfer. Out cutting some small little limbs back in his backyard, hit a wire, saw bounced out, came back, he caught it, took off three fingers off his left hand. If you've ever played golf, you know that those three fingers are pretty important to hold on the club. Uh, had another case of, a, of an attorney who was a wood turner, and he was cutting a small tree, and it had a bullet, a shell, lodged in the middle of it. Hit the shell, saw it bounced out, came back, had a severe laceration across his leg. Really never, ever recovered completely from it because of just the amount of, of injury to all the muscles and muscle groups. Uh, Next slide. Bounce back injuries uh, are, are the main thing that we worry about when using a chainsaw. And the thing that is the key is that many times we know a line on the wood that we want to cut. We have, a, we have in mind what shape we want for a bowl to be out, what shape we want, or someone has asked us to cut on this line. So we sit right over here and we look at this line and that's where we're gonna cut. There's a red line. You need to stay away from that red line. The saw needs to be out here. You need to be over here, both hands on it. Next slide. And as I said, to minimize the occurrence of severe injuries, you need to stay out of that line with the saw. Now, that sounds good, but I've gone with George where we've cut many trees, or several trees, but several of us are out there cutting branches. And I myself um, have done some of the unforgivable things. Uh, next slide. Typical facial injury from bounce back. You can move on to the next slide. According to the National uh, Surveillance System, the, the uh, nail gun is the next most dangerous tool we use. Can't tell you how many feet people nail their own foot and shoe to whatever they're nailing. And you know, they come in with, to the emergency room with all the boards and everything intact because they can't get the nail back out. Also had a gentleman that was putting up a, a crate and he couldn't get everything kind of shoved together, so he put his knee up against it to shove the board up while well, everything slipped, and he put the nail through his femur into his tibia with the knee bent. Became an emergency and very quick because of the severe cramping in the leg. We, he had to be put to sleep before we could even get him under control. So all these things are, are, are errors of, of judgment. I don't want to say they're stupid errors, but they are. And uh, the third most uh, dangerous uh, power tool is the power saw. I think with the saw stop and some of these other things that we have today, that maybe that's going to be less of an injury. But again, I must tell you, I was over at George's, and I was ripping a piece of wood, and I didn't push the one side all the way through. It caught the saw and came flying back. It hit his door. Fortunately, no one was standing in the door. No one, the door wasn't open, uh, it would have been a severe injury. You can't stop the piece of wood after it's got started. Only thing you can do is prevent it. Don't ever push anything through the saw with your fingers. It, you, if you have a stick or anything else that you can use, use the stick, push it through. Make sure you push it all the way through. If you do happen to cut off some fingers, I must tell you, Take them, perhaps somebody put them in a clean plastic bag, put them on ice, and take them with you. Because today, a lot of them can be reimplanted, and at least you have a finger. Uh, it's, it's the pits to have a glove, I mean, you have a, a glove with four fingers, and you only have two to put in it. 
So even though maybe it doesn't work like it normally would have, if you have it there, it, it, it's a filler. Next slide. Uh, I've talked, talked about, about the kickback. Kick uh, go, go ahead, the next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about shop safety and some health hazards. We've already mentioned flying debris, vibration I'll get into, noise, chemical hazards, and then last but not least, the wood dust. Next slide. First question is, are you wearing the right face shield or any face shield at all? And the correct type of face shield that we need to wear is a Z87 plus shield. The little plastic shields with the metal rim around the top of them are really for paint splashes and things like that, but they're not for protection against anything, a flying object that could head your way off of a, of a lathe or anything else. Uh, the, uh, next slide. Occasionally, when returning small objects, it's probably okay to wear a pair of glasses, but it needs to be safety glasses. I must tell you that I started my wood turning at the community college in Santa Fe, New Mexico. My instructor was Al Merriman, and I can promise you we didn't start the lathe if we didn't have face mask on. And if we did start the lathe without the face mask on, he would ask us to leave and go think about that for a while. There was no question about it. You put a face mask on. Next slide. I think when we're instructing students, and even in open shop, other things, we need to be better, better mentors. We need to wear a face shield, and we need to have them wear a face shield. And I can promise you that we, um, at our open shop, we usually have five blades running, there's grinders running, there's table saws running, band saws running, and of course all the, the uh, scrubbers and, and uh, different types of shock, shop back systems. But rarely do we see anybody wearing any type of any safety equipment at all. And it's just, uh, it's just human nature. That's just the way we do it. Uh, it's not right, but it's the way we do it. But I think we need to set an example, both long-term and short-term. Long-term for ourselves and for the students. Short-term to start changing our attitude. Next. going to talk a little bit about vibration. And it's something that we're learning a whole lot more about. Uh, handheld tools, when you're working on the lathe, there's always a certain amount of vibration. When you're using a chainsaw, there's a certain amount of vibration. Most everything we use in the wood shop causes some degree of vibration. And this can cause injury to the small vessels of the hands. And it's now labeled uh, uh, traumatic vasospastic disease. Uh, chainsaw uh, workers in Norway, about 54% have traumatic vasospastic disease just from chainsaws. What happens is this produces symptoms we call Raynaud's phenomenon. And Raynaud's is when the fingers start to tingle. And in wintertime, they'll get white. They get cold. And after, after we gave this, I gave this talk in, in our club, Several people talked to me and said, oh, I've already got that. It takes about eight years to develop. Unfortunately, it's not reversible. There's a, an easy diagnosis, and I have an instrument out in the car that I didn't bring in. It's called a two-point discriminator. But it, it's something you, you check two points, and it gets further and further and further apart, where you can tell that it's two points. Otherwise, you think it's just one. And that's the easiest and first test. But pretty soon you get so you, well, that might be a quarter, but it might be a nickel. I can't feel the rough edge anymore. It might be a dime or it might be a penny, but still can't feel the rough edge. And this is part of Raynaud's phenomena in basal spastic disease. It's all called, also called halves. And that's a hand arm vascular syndrome. But I think that the basal spastic disease sort of explains it better. It gets to the point where in the wintertime, even when the temperature is only 50 degrees, you're outside and you say, ooh, my fingers are getting cold. I can't, I, and you put gloves on, and it really doesn't help because it then restricts the blood flow even more if they're tight gloves. 
So you end up wearing a mitten. Well, that's really inconvenient uh, for the most part. But it's sometimes what you have to do to keep your hands from getting worse. Because now with the decreased circulation, you can get frostbite and you can get other problems that make, it, make your condition even worse. Go ahead. Next slide. We'll talk a little bit about noise hazards. This is something we totally neglect. And I say we, meaning moi. Uh, the, uh, there's many hazards that we're beginning to learn about. We know that it's causative to long-term hearing loss. And so a lot of guys, older guys, say, oh, well, I've, you know, I've already lost my hearing anyhow. I can't hear. So it doesn't make any difference. It's cumulative. And it does make a difference because it continues to get worse. Um, many occasions, we'll be confined in a shop, on an open shop. We'll have five lathes running, as I said before. We'll have a bandsaw running, maybe a, a, a grinder, uh, somebody sharpening some tools. We'll have other instruments running, as well as the dust collectors and the scrubbers. Uh, again, no one seems to be protecting their hearing at all in these cases. Piston-driven chainsaw is about 110 decibels. If you put two piston-driven chainsaws together, it's not really 220, but it amounts to about 115 to 120. And again, these are noises that are really devastating to your hearing. Repeated long-term exposure just keeps adding greater and greater to this hearing loss. Yes, ma'am. It, it starts at about, about 90, 95. Our hearing range is 20 hertz to uh, 20,000 hertz. And it, it affects us in different pitches. I can't, all right, see, I can't, that's, the, my wife's here, I gotta be careful. I, I don't hear, I don't hear the, the higher pitches very well anymore. But I speak in a lower tone, so it doesn't matter. But I can hear men talk. But sometimes women, and I can't, I, it, it's hard for me to hear them because I've lost that. So <laughs> it, it's, it's an excuse, guys. I mean, it works. <laughs> I, I, I use it frequently. Okay. Uh, anyhow, it's, it's, you know, the thing of it is, is we, we don't, we're out on a mower or we're using a chainsaw, no ear protection again. And it, it's just one of those things that we have to start thinking differently about how we treat ourselves. It's, it's how, we, how we deal with our own, our own systems. Next slide. Gonna talk a little bit about chemical hazards. Polyurethane makes a beautiful, long-lasting sheen. Some of the woodworking over here that has polyurethane on is absolutely beautiful. Polyurethane is a toxic chemical and it has to be treated with caution. I know that when George puts seven or eight coats of polyurethane on some of his bowls, and vases and all, he'll have both ends of the shop open with four or five fans running, the scrubber, everything going. But a lot of us sit in there in our little room and we're painting on our polyurethane, go sand it off a little bit, paint another coat on, with no thought about what we're doing to ourselves. Uh, polyurethane is a petrochemical resin, and it contains isocyanates. These are uh, chemicals of urethane and cyanide. A lot of things that we use contain cyanide, and years ago, cyanide used to be hard to get. Today, I guess you can't. Uh, I know that when I was a kid, we used to try and get cyanide to kill ants with, if you can believe that. Um, this, the, uh, Cyanides are, are known respiratory uh, toxins. They produce asthma, headaches, vomiting, nausea, the shortness of breath. You have to remember that when you're removing polyurethanes, the dust is just as toxic as when you're putting the stuff on in the first place. In fact, probably more toxic, because now you're getting fine particles in. Because it's on the first sanding, we use fine sandpaper. We don't want to mess it up too bad, but we want to use fine sandpaper. Next slide. The short-term uh, effects, not usually a problem. It's a long-term or repeated effects 
that can bring about serious uh, problems. Because many, many chemical solvents are absorbed through the skin. We use patches to give medications now. We use patches for different uh, types of uh, pain control, patches for a lot of things where the substance has to be absorbed through the skin. Uh, well, these things are absorbed through the skin also. And most of it is the problem of the solvents that are in these things that cause the problem. Polyurethane aerosols. I, I have my little can, I shake it up and I spray it and all this stuff. You ingest this stuff into your, into your lungs, into your mouth, you do it into your throat, it starts causing gastrointestinal problems to boot. Next slide. Varnishes are acid catalyzed coatings that contain formaldehyde. Now, a lot of problems with formaldehyde. A good example is after uh, Hurricane Katrina, there was a company in Oregon that built several hundred mobile homes to send down to Katrina, uh, down to uh, New Orleans for uh, the victims of uh, Katrina. Well, the wood they used had so much formaldehyde that the things weren't livable. And so all of these, all these home, motor homes, or not motor homes, but uh, uh, not trailer homes, sit unused. They, they, were never, they were never occupied. Solvents and varnish contain toluene, xylene, methyl ethyl ketones, the methyl isob isobutyl ketones, methanol. I can tell you a little bit about, about the toluene. Toluene is a universal solvent. And for those of you who have ever used cactus juice to harden wood, what you're using is methyl methacrylate. And methyl methacrylate is a polymer and a monomer that's mixed together. It's with vacuum is sucked into the wood to make it, make it harder. First reference I could ever see about that was in 1980 out of Brigham Young University. We use methyl methacrylate in many different systems. In the medical field, if you've ever had or known anybody that has a total knee or total hip or shoulder or some other artificial joint that was cemented in, it was cemented in with methyl methacrylate, polymethyl methacrylate. And uh, methyl methacrylate is a very common substance. You know it as, as uh, plexiglass. But we use the catalyst and it would ex speed it up the process of, of of this setting so it didn't have to sit for a long time because you, you can't leave the wound open for hours while you're waiting for the uh, cement to set up. We would uh, stir this first in a liquid form. You pour the monomer on the polymer and you start mixing it all up. And when it finally got sticky enough that like putty, you could pick it up in your hand and you start working it so that you could then put it wherever you want it to be where you're going to put the uh, prosthesis. Well, after very short period of time, we noticed that our hands were starting to break out and there's a problem. So we wear two pairs of gloves, three pairs of gloves, whatever it took. Didn't work, it still worked its way right through everything. We solved the problem, had the nurses mix <laughs> it. No, uh, that, that, well, that is partly true, but we didn't do it for long. We got mixing bowls that had suction on them and, and would get the fumes out of, out of the operating room and uh, make it so that it was safer. Uh, we, uh, my wife is the operating room nurse, that's why I say that. So she, <laughs> she would confirm that part of it is true. 2,4-paradiotoluene uh, is a universal solvent. And it gets in your lungs, it gets everywhere. And you really have to be careful about using it. Um, uh, go on to the next slide. Go ahead. It will go through just about any. We tried every type of glove you can imagine to mix it. We even had some guys bring in these sterilized, well, things we had to sterilize first up. We couldn't, we couldn't do it to anything else. But we tried everything. And short of putting it in a metal bowl with a cover on it and a suction tube on it, we didn't come up with anything. And that, was, that, that ended up being the answer. Short-term effects are to the eyes and throat, cause headaches, dizziness, 
confusion, nausea. Long-term effects are to the central nervous system, uh, can damage the lungs, liver, kidneys, also damages the reproductive systems. And this is more important in the youngsters. Uh, most of us aren't thinking about having any more children, at least at our age, but, but for youngsters it is a problem, and they need to be careful, and they need to be warned. If somebody needs to sit and grab by the collar and say, hey, get that vent, get ventilation, get, get that out of there. Next slide. Show you what, what happens. This is a picture sort of, of the lung on, on the uh, left-hand side, and on the right-hand side is a little patch that's taken out of this, and you can see the little circle over on the uh, left lobe. And this circle would have an alveoli in it. And if I took one of these alveoli and drew it, it might sort of look like a, a soccer ball with many sides. If we took all the alveoli in the lungs of an average adult male, and we open them up and we spread them out, they would just about cover a football field. You say, well, that's a whole lot of space there. This is where the air exchange comes in. Air, air comes in here. There's vascular blood supplies around both sides of these things. And this is where we trade CO2 for oxygen. We get rid of all the bad stuff. We bring in some oxygen. Next slide. This slide, by the way, is, is <laughs> drawn wrong. They show the pulmonary artery as being fresh blood, and the pulmonary vein as being the old blood. That's not the way it works. But I have another slide that's right. Go ahead. Next. Uh huh. The one that's on this side. The one the one's on your right hand side. That's the left lung. That's exactly right. Cardiac nausea. Heart sits a little bit off to the left in most of us. Sometimes it's centered, sometimes it's way off to the left. Okay. And uh you're working on it. That little, that little circle is what this represents up here. So if you can imagine a whole bunch of these things being here together, uh, on and on and on, on. On the right lobe, there's three lobes on the right-hand side. And you can see on the left-hand side of the picture is three lobes. And there's, there's, it goes up the back. Oh, it varies, but it probably goes up at least two-thirds the distance of the, of the lung. Uh-huh. It, it's it's it's, it's pear shaped. It goes up up the back up the back side. So the front looks like it's just a little bitty thing down there, but most of that's in the back. We make any progress? I'll go ahead and start talking about adhesives. Uh, we more and more and more are using adhesives. Uh, I uh, had the opportunity when I uh, discontinued my practice of medicine, I decided I was going to invent a bone glue. And I decided the kid comes in with a broken arm, all you had to do is put it back straight, squirt some glue in there, and send them out, and they'd be well. Uh, I got together with a, a bioadhesive guy. In fact, he was an adhesive specialist from the University of Oregon. He's the one that uh, finally figured out with NASA how to glue the uh, tiles on the 
space, space shuttle, shuttle so that when it returned, it, uh, they wouldn't come off. And Daryl and I worked on this for a long time. We had various different types of glue that we, uh, and it ended up that most of them were cyanoacrylates. Uh, again, the, the, the tip off for the name cyanide and cyanoacrylates, it's, it's CA glue, but we, what we used. But all of these were, had different, different uh, formulas. Some had long chain formulas, some were short chain. And the problem was, is, is ordering these things, we, uh, it, it's hard to get some company in, in Europe to manufacture a certain type of glue that they're making. They want to send you a barrel full of it. Well, we didn't want to buy a barrel full of it. We're going to buy it a little bit and try it out and see what's going to work. And we finally got down to where we had bones where we could take uh, sheep bones or cattle bones and put them. We had a machine that was a tensiometer that we could bend them and they would break in a new spot but not at the glued spot. And then we finally got so that we could do it in a, a moist atmosphere. And uh, we went out to California to present this and they told us that the FDA had outlawed cyanoacrylates for internal use in the body. And that was the end of that. We probably should have gone on to uh, work it out on the veterinary side, but by that time we were so discouraged we just flushed it and, and gave the project up. But I can tell you that uh, when we're using glues, and we use CA glues, when you fill up a crack and come back and sand it, all the little dust that you're getting is still CA glue. And uh, when we start uh, what happens? I'm going to talk a little bit more about dust here in a minute. But the, the alveoli the dust that we are worried about is the very, very, very fine dust. And I didn't really understand this that well. The dust that you can see is at least 40 microns in size. It's not that dust that you can see that's really bothering your lungs. Because the natural uh, process of, of the cilia and uh, mucus and everything else helps get rid of a certain amount of that. It's the dust that's one or two microns in size that gets into the lungs. It, nothing stops it. And so if you can imagine these little dust particles starting to accumulate down here in the bottom of the lung, and then we come by and we very nicely put a little coat of polyurethane on it so that it will stay there for a long time. And then, and then we add a little bit of lacquer in here and we'll put a coat of, of lacquer on here, and, and then we'll put some more dust particles on there. And pretty soon we get this thing filled up with all the things that we put in there. We didn't mean to. We didn't think about it when we were doing it, but we're doing it. And this is the part that I didn't think about. After I started getting ready to give this talk, I stopped turning for three months until I got myself an air scrubber, until I got shop backs, and I got everything ready. I wasn't going to turn anymore. It, it, it frightened me that much. The problem is, is pretty soon, this, this big this cavity that we used to exchange air in is full of all this extraneous stuff. And we say that you have COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And pretty soon you're having to carry around your little oxygen because you can't get enough air in there because this space doesn't have any room for air. So you have to put in 100% oxygen in there to have enough air in there to, to make the exchange. We, uh, oh, we're good? That's fine, yeah, that's, that's fine. That's my dust slide. <laughs> you, you can go on from there. Oh, smoking adds up to it. It's a nice coat of tar in there. You put this coat of tar in there, and then the dust even sticks in there better. So, oh, no, it's, it's absolutely. If you look at the lungs of a smoker, they'll be black. 
I mean, if you go, if you have the opportunity to go to a morgue and see the dissection, I mean, the autopsy, the lungs are black from the tar that's gone into the lungs, and they've totally coated the lungs to where they're black. The uh, Well, it does. Uh, there's some natural processes that help clean it out. It never completely leaves. It never completely And that's the tragedy of seeing these kids. It doesn't matter if they're smoking tobacco or cannabis or whatever the hell they want to smoke. It still is a chemical irritant. Like I say, my own father smoked. But he died of cancer, too. But you couldn't stop him at that time. For those, a lot of, a lot of us uh, understand how small a micron is, particularly the guys that do metal machine work. I brought along a ruler and one inch. Here's, here's my one inch from there to there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exaggerate this and I'll make my one inch over here. If I fill this in, with microns. I only have to put in 25,400 microns in here to make up one inch. 25,400. I'll be through in just a minute here. It's just unbelievable to me how small that really is. But those are the particles that get into the lungs that we're not stopping. Yes, sir. When you have what? No, not really. It shows, uh, it shows uh, the, the, the tissue of the lung. And if the lung is solid and you have a lot of solid stuff in there, it will show lesions like that. But no, it can't show it, it, can't show it that much. It really doesn't get down to that. No. Um, at any rate, Turner's, uh, you can go to the next. Okay. We, uh, we have three different things that we create when we're turning wood. We create large, large particles. We create um, the uh, scra uh, scraping, sanding, all this stuff. But we do a lot more than that while we're turning. And I'll talk more about spalted woods in just a few minutes. But when we're sanding dust, the glues, the fillers we use, the hardeners that we talked about, the methyl methacrylate that we've infused into wood to make it harder. That came from spalting. We spalted the wood to make it soft, then we hardened it so we could cut it. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, and, and, all the, and all the epoxy resins. You want to go to the next slide? Okay. The dust effects are to the lungs, the eyes, the digestive system. The health risk is directly related to the particle size and the concentration. In other words, how many of these things you got coming into you at any one time. If we can't see them, then we don't think they're there. And I, 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 I must tell you that I'm not a saint about any of these things because I would be very careful about wearing a dust mask and all this stuff and then take it off and get my air hose out and start cleaning up. <laughs> Well, that's what you do, and, but it's too hot, and I didn't want to have it on anymore, and I had my face mask on, so I just took it all off and, and started uh, spreading the stuff all over. Some of them do in the carrier that they use, and the, the FDA is getting better about it. A lot of this... A lot of this was not controlled at all by the FDA. Everybody always supposes that because you can buy it on the shelf, it's safe. Well, you can buy vitamins on the shelf. There's no control. Nobody looks at the vitamin and says, it has so much vitamin D in it. They don't care. They'll be selling you an empty pill. It doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't have, it doesn't have to be anything. There's no control.
I don't know about that. I don't know how much it takes. I'm sure that some animals, dogs and, and other things, that they're, they're smelling as, as 200 times, not twice as good, 200 times as good as our smelling. And they probably can detect it. I would doubt that we can. Uh, maybe some people, you know, certain people can sniff wine and tell you that it has coconut oil in it or something. Uh, well, some of us can't, you know. It's, it's, Yeah. You know, it's like everything else. It makes good sense to just open the windows and let that let all that air get out of there until it until it's fired up. It's just it's just common sense. That, that, and we, I always when I first get in, it's hot. I open the windows, let let some air get through there first, and then go ahead. Yeah. Absolutely. 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 That's how you got it into your nose. That's where you got it to the receptors where you can smell it. Well, I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, uh, anyhow, uh, we can continue on. Next slide. Uh, okay, we've kind of already discussed this. The smallest particle you can uh, see is 40 microns. And that's, that's one twenty-five thousand four hundredths of an inch, and I still just can't realize that. Uh, particles of ten micron really probably are still not the real problem. It's the smaller ones, the two, the one, and it's the one micron and even smaller that cause these deposits to occur down here in this lung that we're filling up with with all this dust and. And all, then put a nice coat of polyurethane on it, and put a little bit of CA glue on it, and then all of a sudden we can't breathe. That's strange. Hard to believe. Next one. This is a picture of the of the uh, bronchial tree, trachea on the top, and the, and the bronchial tree. Go on to the next one. This shows again the alveoli, and and this. Uh, is a, is a better depiction because it shows the arterial blood coming in as blue and the venous blood going back to the heart as being red. But again, it shows the alveoli down there. And if you uh, fill all this up and continue to fill it up, then all the air that you think is coming in there, there's no room. There's no room. And this is, you keep hearing all the time about people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It's obstructive because they can't get the air in. You can't blow air out, but you don't have air in, so you can't get more in. Go on to the next slide. Next one. Uh, the fine particles are so small that our natural defenses can't, can't catch them all. Also, as we grow older, we lose some of our elasticity of the lungs, and the, the capacity uh, of the lungs decrease. Also, we start to bend over a little bit so we don't expand the lungs and the apices of the lungs. The National Institute of Occupational Safety sets standards for a maximum amount of fine dust allowed in the workplace. When we use fine sandpaper, we exceed that level by about a hundred times. And we're not thinking about it. We don't, we, we don't even, that's, that's when we put on our polyurethane coat, we use fine sandpaper because we don't want to screw it up. We're going to put on another coat, but we just want to make it rough enough for the next coat to adhere. And that's where we start getting into trouble. Uh, go ahead, the next slide. Uh, when we're when we're turning, we, we uh, the lathe creates dust in a level halfway between the floor and the ceiling. But unfortunately, that's where we are, and usually we're right over it while it's happening. And then we are doing a hollowing, and we take the air hose and we stick in there, and we get down there and we look, and we blow all the dust out. And we don't have mask on. 
We breathe it all in. But we do it. I, as I said, I'm no saint when it comes to anything. One of the things I want to talk a little bit about is spalted wood. Um, uh, spalting is a natural decay process of wood. With, uh, with the advent of all the exposure of floods and all the other stuff, we come, become more concerned about mold. And in this case, we're talking about black mold. And black mold, there's a, there's a huge difference between black mold and decay mold. The black mold is, uh, a, I would, I'd pronounce this for you, but I can't. That's what it's called. <laughs> Stacky Boltres, B O that's a B, O T R E S. Uh, the uh, the spalting uh, of wood does not produce the same fungi that are in mycotoxins, and mycotoxins are the fungi that cause the respiratory illnesses that we know of as coccidioidomycosis or valley fever. Histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, tuberculosis, all of these are mycotoxins that are from fungus. Fungus affects us in many ways, everything from our toenails to ringworm. Uh, fungus is all over. If you walk through the woods, probably with each step you take in the woods, you stir up 100 to 1,000 spores of, of mold. The problem is, is the spores last a long time. They uh, have now speculated that the spores can last from as, as long as a thousand years to even more. And all they need is the right environment and they become back alive. So is using spalted wood for a bowl or something else you're going to be eat out, eating out of it, is that okay? Yeah, it is. If it's dried, if it's sealed with polyurethane or whatever you're going to use to seal it so that spores don't get out. And uh, the, uh, but the problem is, is, you know, people say, well, I'm just sanding this. Again, the spores, when you're sanding po uh, uh, a bowl that has, has been uh, spalted, you're getting all these spores in your lungs. And it's another one of these layers that we were talking about that given the right opportunity, all of a sudden they become a problem. And you have some sort of systemic infection that you can't control. The, um, uh, no ma'am? Well, I shouldn't say that. On, on, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I worked at a hospital in the military that where we treated all the mycotic infections. And I don't know if you know it, but Military hospitals, if you're a congressman and your child gets one of these illnesses, you're entitled to go to the military hospital for free. Good deal. Uh, but we had all these people, and the drugs that we were treating them with were drugs that you use for cancer. Amphotericin B, things like that. I mean, bad poisons that kill these drugs. And they would be all over. I mean, the... the Infections would involve the kidneys, the liver. We, we biopsied everything to see where they were to start uh, definite treatment. But no, not, not just uh, for, for tuberculosis, rifampin, the thambutol. Some of these drugs um, work, but they're really slow. I mean, you, you take them for years, and even then, you don't ever know. And particularly if it gets into your bone. Because if it's in the bone, then it's, it's these little spicules you can't get the stuff into. So you have it forever. That's Pott's disease. Mm -hmm. if, you wear, if you wear appropriate protection, you can do anything you want to. Uh, <laughs> that, that, yeah. Yeah, uh, we can go on the next slide. What can we do? 
Local exhaust ventilation. I told you that when after I started this talk, I quit turning for about three months until I got my shop changed. I might hurt my shop had been a little place where it had a low ceiling. I didn't have room to put a, a air scrubber in it uh, above me, so I moved my shop over to another part to the barn, actually, where I had higher ceilings that I could put in a scrubber. I got all the vacs set up so I can have suction right there at the lathe or whatever I'm going to do. I still don't have any ventilation system set up for using lacquers and stuff like that, so I go outside. That doesn't always work. That's, that's not always such a good deal. Uh, ambient filters, uh, dust collectors, shop vacs. The shop vac is made for speed. The ventilation uh, filters are made for volume. The average garage holds about 2,000 cubic feet of air. The shop, you go, you go to the next uh, slide. The shop vac will clean about 200 cubic feet of air if it's a good one. A, uh, an air filter will clear, clear anywhere from 600 to 2,000 cubic feet of air, depending upon the size and the location of what you have. A uh, lot of difference. The, uh, the dust collector works fast, uh, right there while you're collecting the dust right off the lathe if you have it set up with the hood and all. Uh, but the ambient air cleaners clean the air. And, and uh, it, to me now, they're just a must. I think that you owe it to yourself, you owe it to whoever else is in your shop with you, to have a system set up that they're not breathing all this stuff. The, uh, the bowl turning creates its own, its, its own system of, of dust flying in the air. Even as you turn it off, it's still, until it's through spinning, it's still doing its work. Go on to the next slide. Dust masks are sometimes way, 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 way overrated. Uh, the, uh, the more expensive, in, in fact, 3M says right on this mask <laughs> that it's not for protection. Some of the, some of the companies say that this is for, uh, they'll, they'll write something on the box. Had a lot of people say, oh, well, I use a surgical mask. Well, I used a surgical mask too. Not to protect the bugs from me, from the patient to me, it was to protect the bugs from me to the patient. They're one-way masks. They don't work. You see people in these places where they're running around and everyone's covered up with a mask and all this stuff. Sometimes they're using a one-way mask that they got the wrong direction. You got to turn it wrong side out if they're going to protect themselves from all the stuff that's coming in from the outside air. Uh, so that uh, a lot of these masks uh, offer no protection and, uh, but they lull us into thinking that we're doing something. First off, because it fits underneath the face mask and it does all this other stuff so good. The others are hard to use, and I must admit it's difficult, uh, but still it's necessary. Uh, so uh, we have a gentleman in our, in our club that swears that he, because he uses a dental mask, that he's protected. That's all he needs. And, you know, you're not going to convince him anything different. But it's a one-way protection. It's to protect him from the wood. It's not to protect... It's not, in other words, he's not going to give the wood any disease. But the wood certainly can still affect him, because it can still go through the mask. Next slide. Well, yeah, no. It, it, it's, they're bent so that they fit over your nose. And the color, the beautiful pink color, the blue colors on the outside, the white colors on the inside, that's to protect the patient from me. But that's not to protect me from him. If I'm going to wear that, then I need to wear a hood. And we, we did surgery. We would wear these hooded things that had vacuum cleaners on both sides. You couldn't hear a damn word that anybody was saying, but it, 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 it did it was safe. Next slide. Okay, I'm ready quick. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah. 
Absolutely, and I do it every so often, but I don't do it any more often than I have to do it. <laughs> yes, yes, we, uh, and we, uh, I must, we went riding Saturday, and I came home and had to clean out the trailer and know I was in there, dust throwed out all this stuff and everything else, and no, I didn't have a mask on, and no, I didn't intend to go get a mask on. And until I got through, I didn't think about it, and then I thought, what are you doing? Yeah. yeah. Excuse me, go ahead. Yes. You know, I don't know, and I've been trying to, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get to a, uh, I'm trying to get <laughs> Woodworld, Woodcraft, somebody to help me collect a bunch of masks and do some tests to show how effective they are when they need to be changed, particularly the cartridge masks, uh, all, all this. And uh, I just, I've been too lazy to get it done, to be real honest. It's not that I haven't had people volunteer and, and to help me get the, the masks and everything else. But I haven't done it yet. But I can't answer your question. I don't know. I really don't know. It's expensive. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. But I, don't, I, can't, I can't answer your question because I don't know the answer. I, I could give you what I think, but that would be, you know. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah. That's right. I would I would guess so, and I, but I don't know what point that is, which is what he asked. How long do they last, and when do you need to change them? I, I, I don't know that, and uh, well, you know, I've I've got some I've got the cartridges, and, and I, I've wondered how long is it going to take for it to get hard to breathe. I'm not there yet, I, I guess, but I, I might not be doing a dang bit of good. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. That's what that's the problem. If you can see it, it's not small. <laughs> yes, but that that too, and, and that, that's a big help. That's as far as the the uh, adhesives and the polyurethanes and all that stuff. That's, that, that is a key, and I think that that's something that we really need to think about. Yeah. Not really. I mean, you, it, it would be so minute that uh, I, uh, I've worn these things for a long time. <laughs> Or wore surgical baths for 30 some odd years, 35 years, and I, I had very little faith in them. We wore them, but when we started, you know, we had to prevent infections with hips, then we wore a hood where the air was sucked out. There was new air coming in, the old air was sucked out, so that 
absolutely there was no air that we were breathing that got to the patient. And uh, by the grace of God, I did a lot of total joints, but I never had any infections. But an infection's a disaster. And so is all this stuff to our lungs. It's a disaster. But it's happening, and we kind of let it happen, and we say, well, shoot, I didn't know that was going on. Well, you kind of do, you know. You got to It's just there has to be some degree of intuition that says this ain't good. Okay. John, thank you for having me.